Welcome to the second Economy, Jobs and Fair Work Committee meeting of 2018. Uh, may I remind everyone to turn off any electrical devices that may interfere with the sound system. Uh, first of all, may I ask our new member, Kezia Dugdale, to make any declaration of interest she may have. Uh, thanks, Convener. If I can just declare that I'm a member of Community Trade Union and a member of Engender. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now, the Next decision is item two on the agenda, which is a decision to take items five, six, and seven in private. Has the committee agreed to that? Yes. Thank you. Um, I would now welcome Keith Brown, Cabinet Secretary for Economy, Jobs, and Fair Work, along with uh, those from his team who are with us, Lorraine King, who's Head of Consumer Competition Deregulation Unit, uh, Denise Swanson, who is Head of Access to Justice Unit, Greg Walker, who is a solicitor with the Scottish Government Legal Directorate, and John St. Clair, the Senior Principal Legal Officer in the Scottish Government. Um, now, the Cabinet Secretary is here to speak to us about a legislative consent motion on the Financial Guidance and Claims Bill, which is a UK Parliament piece of legislation, so I'll invite uh, Mr. Brown to make an opening statement on that. Thank you, Convener, and thanks for the opportunity to speak in support of this LCM. Uh, the Financial Guidance and Claims Bill makes provision for, first of all, establishing a new financial guidance body, including provision about cold calling and a debt respite scheme, uh, as well as the funding of debt advice in Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland, and the regulation of claims management services. And the Bill's overarching focus is on ensuring members of the public are able to access free and impartial money guidance pensions guidance and debt advice. It also has an access to justice purpose, ensuring that they are able to access high quality claims handling services by strengthening the regulation of claims management companies. Uh, to enable this, the bill provides in two areas. Uh, first of all, the creation of a single financial guidance body and provision for the funding of debt advice in the devolved administrations, and also the transfer of claims management regulation from the Claims Management Regulation Unit in the Ministry of Justice to the Financial Conduct Authority. Uh, the Bill also makes provision for two connected purposes, the creation of a debt respite scheme, also known as a breathing space scheme, by secondary regulations, and the introduction of a ban on cold calling by secondary re regulations. The Single Financial Guidance Body, or SFGB, will replace three publicly funded services currently provided by the Money Advice Service, PensionWise and the Pensions Advisory Service. It will be responsible for delivering debt advice in England and money guidance and pensions guidance across the UK. The provision of debt advice has already been devolved and this bill devolves the levy funding associated with this debt advice provision. These monies are gathered from an existing levy on the financial services sector under the Financial Services and Markets Act 2000. However, under the terms of the new funding formula for devolved levy funding for debt advice provision in Scotland, the Scottish Government has negotiated an improved allocation that will ensure Scotland's share takes account of, first of all, the adult population share that we have and also the levels of indebtedness in Scotland. Accordingly, without this LCM, the provision for the levy funding for this advice provision would not be devolved to Scotland, meaning existing, less favourable financing arrangements would continue to apply. And as outlined in the LCM, other provisions under Part 1 of the Bill will have a bearing on Scotland, for example, the statutory objective on the SFGB to work closely with the Scottish Government on the provision of information, guidance and advice, and a requirement on the SFGB to work with the Scottish Government in coordinating the development of a national strategy to improve the financial capability of Scottish citizens and their ability to manage debt, and the provision, of course, of financial education to children and young people. Beyond the specific core functions of the SFGB, the Scottish Government has also obtained agreement on certain wider principles that shall apply in respect of the new body, namely that it must take greater account of differences in the money and debt advice landscape in Scotland to ensure that available resources are pooled effectively, delivering a more holistic and joined-up advice landscape, and also establishing a committee with membership drawn from representatives from each of the devolved administrations thereby embedding the Scottish Government in SFGB governance arrangements, providing it with influence and ensuring that collaborative working is achieved in practice across money and pensions guidance, and also be capable of channelling funding in a way that best ensures effective oversight and coordination, or delivering debt advice in light of the devolution of levy funding. 
Uh, part two extends the regulation of claims management companies by the Financial Conduct Authority to Scotland in a development sought by the Scottish Government and welcomed by the Justice Committee in its stage one report on the civil litigation <coughs> expenses in group proceedings, Scotland Bill. So I hope the committee supports our view that a legislative consent motion is necessary and happy to try and answer any questions, convener. Thank you very much for that. May I start just with a question about timings? And um, the first point is about uh, the bill was introduced at Westminster on 22nd June 2017. And I think in normal circumstances, an LCM would be lodged no later than two weeks after introduction of a bill. But in this case, it was lodged uh, much later. That is on 13th December 2017. Um, so could you first of all perhaps explain how that came about? And the second question I have is, when do you envisage the bill coming into force in Scotland, and are, is everything set up and being prepared so that it can take effect and be effective for those who um, need debt advice and so forth, and claims management companies here? Okay, so I think on the first point, Kevin, I think I wrote to you on this matter, the um, delay that has happened has been down to the fact that um, I mentioned in the opening statement the um, discussions around the levy funding, um, and I think it's probably true to say that having come to this uh, afresh, I was um, not uh, willing to accept the current level of funding which apply in relation to Scotland. So that initiated a series of discussions with um, not just ourselves and the UK government, but the other devolved administrations. And I think it's also true from the UK government's point of view that these discussions and other ones associated with this um, bill were multilateral discussions involving different administrations and different interest groups, and that has taken longer than we expected. But it's mainly down to the fact that the discussions that we've had in terms of the levy funding. As a result of that, I think we will increase our levy funding from around two, I think, £2.2 .2 million pounds to maybe a bit more than that, to over £4.7 million, and that's been the basis of the discussions. In relation to when it will become um, enacted, again, that lies uh, with Westminster, but I understand that they intend to bring it back uh, to its next stage uh, after the February recess, but perhaps when the officials would give some more clarity on both that and the process after it. <coughs> So um, we um, are looking at um, the second reading being in the House of Commons uh, around the 22nd of January um, and Royal Assent being uh, sometime after um, February recess. Um, we, obviously, we don't know that. The, the report in third reading will be post 20th of February and then it will go through its, Lord, um, House, its House of Lords readings and then on to Royal Assent. So we don't have the, the final timings of that, but we do know that we're expecting the second reading in the committee stage um, later on this month. All right, thank you. And as far as implementation? Uh, well, we are taking uh, this forward, and of course it builds on the current provision which is there, but I think it's also true to say that, uh, as you'll know, convener, we're bringing forward uh, legislation to establish a consumer body, so that will happen. The consultation for that will happen uh, over the next few weeks and months, and this will be something that's further evolves during that process. But, I mean, the way it was dealt with up till now was obviously through grant giving to different bodies through Scottish Legal uh, Advice uh, Bureau, and uh, so that um, infrastructure is already there, but it will be developed over time. Thank you. And now some committee members, I think, have questions. Um, Colin Beatty, did you want to come in? Um, Cabinet Secretary, just one or two questions around about the funding provision. Just to be clear, this, uh, this new formula, does it directly replace the existing funding or is it additional funding in itself? It, it's the same process by which <coughs> it's raised through a levy, but it completely replaces the existing funding. Do we know what the formula is for raising this levy? from the financial services because you know it's, it's easy to say a levy on financial services but what's the basis is it a turnover tax is it is it a transaction tax or is it a fixed sum according to whatever type of company it is 
I'm able to let the officials answer that, but the, fun, the formula in terms of how it's dispersed, um, I can uh, say, is first of all, it's on a population basis. They take the population of England and extrapolate that to the devolved administrations. And secondly, and I think crucially from our point of view, they also take account of the levels of indebtedness in the different devolved administrations. But as to how it's levied on the financial sector, I don't know if some of the officials want to answer that. The levy is set out in the Financial Services Act uh, 2010, um, and I believe it is based on turnover of companies in the Financial Services Act, but I would have to check and write back to you later today if that was something you wanted more on. I'm just interested the way that uh, it's often phrased here, which says it's a direct levy on financial institutions in Scotland. Clearly, it's not. It's actually across the UK, and we receive just a, a proportion of that. Is that correct? Yes, it's levied on all um, UK financial services companies and it's collected by the Financial Conduct Authority and then goes to the Treasury after that. Will this be a better system than the existing one? I can think of a, a couple of million reasons why it would be better, but um, I think it does give, and that's entirely down to the additional funding, which will be virtually doubled, but I think it's probably best viewed through the fact that, um, as I say, we have these new consumer um, protection powers, really, in terms of... Uh, guidance and so on, and I do think it helps us with that mix of new powers to make sure we have as rational um, a debt advice and consumer advice landscape as possible. I mean, there are currently, I understand, something like 400 different advice bodies in Scotland, not all to do with finance, obviously, but um, so I think um, this additional resource um, will help us make sure that we can dovetail as best we can the work that Citizens Advice Scotland does, for example, but other bodies as well. So uh, I, I think it's a, an improved uh, basis on which to go forward. I mean, obviously, the the increase from about 2.2 to 4.7 million, that's a, that's a tremendous plus point and will enable better service. Is there going to be any sort of traditional, uh, sorry, transitional arrangements as you move from one service to the other? How is that going to work? It, no, by and large. I, we, obviously, we're involved in discussions with, for example, um, Citizens Advice Scotland, uh, both in terms of this and in terms of potential uh, changes in, in terms of the new legislation we're bringing forward for a consumer protection body. So, um, But the day-to-day -day services, I think, will be relatively unchanged. I, I don't know if officials want to add in, anything to that. Um, we've... Um We've been in discussion with uh, MAS um, at the moment. Uh, we have a, a, a partnership agreement that the uh, MAS puts money um, into a grant funding pot uh, that the Scottish Government also contributes to, and that grant funding programme is operated by the Scottish Legal Aid Board on behalf of both MAS um, and the Scottish Government. And we have been having discussions with uh, Money Advice Service um, over the course of the, the final part of last year, and those are continuing, on how we manage that transition from the, the MAS direct funding into the Scottish Government and the Scottish Government having that, that funding uh, directly into its budget. So uh, those discussions are continuing. Given, given that uh, this appears to be a turnover tax, does that mean there's a potential for the amount raised to go up or down? And if so, how, how will that impact us? I would, well, how it will impact us would be if the quantum that's taken in is increased, then the same formula that I mentioned before would apply. So for Scotland and devolved administrations, it would be whatever, um, it would be that share according to both uh, adult population and indebtedness that would apply to whatever the quantum is. So that's how it would be, uh, if you like, flexed if it changes either up or down. Will the Scottish Government have any uh, discussions ongoing with the Treasury uh, in order to manage how this levy is, is being allocated? Yes, we'll do that both um, directly as is necessary and also I'd imagine through the representative on the committee that I mentioned of the single financial uh, body as well. So we're able to have those channels of communication with the UK government. Thank you. And Kezia Dugdale. <laughs> 
Thanks, Kavira. I've got um, some specific questions about the provision of debt advice services, which I think we'll all get to a bit further down the line. But just on the overall pr principle of the UK Act applying in Scotland, are you in any way worried about um, the potential inflexibility of that? So um, when I was reading through the papers, the thing that struck me in particular might be around claim management companies. If there was a very specific problem in Scotland around claim management companies that we wouldn't have the flexibility to address. For example, if a company like Provident, which is um, very prominent in Scotland and Northern Ireland, but less so in England, perhaps missold a product, would we have the flexibility in Scotland to respond to that under the current arrangements? Yeah, I, I, think, uh, I think we would, although I think we've had a very different, you're right to see a very different landscape in Scotland up to this point in terms of claims management companies, which again, the officials will be better versed in this than I, but largely they've been um, at, um, taken forward through um, legal companies. So uh, Digby Brown and people like that are the ones that have taken it forward. And that's meant there's been different requirements, probably a lesser requirement in terms of the, um, if you like, the um, monitoring uh, of their behaviour. That is now changing. So we have now moved to a situation where claims management companies in Scotland are more like those which are operating elsewhere in the UK. But um, So I, I don't think that that should be a problem for that reason, but I don't know if the officials want to come in on that point at all. Um, uh, the FCA already has a UK-wide remit, so um, it's, it's very familiar with the, with the Scottish landscape. It has already uh, been uh, in contact with the Scottish Government. Um, we've had discussions with them on how they might properly address the Scottish context in that re the new regulatory power that it will have. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm certainly meeting with them again later this week. So they are very keen to make sure that the Scottish landscape is, is, is very well accommodated in the way, that in which it, it, the way in which it's going to regulate claims management companies in Scotland. Also, um, there will be subordinate legislation required um, to uh, implement the, the main provisions in this bill. And again, we're working very closely with um, um, HM Treasury um, on the development of those subordinate um, that subordinate le legislation. So a lot of the detail of how that might be delivered and uh, how that needs to be delivered for the Scottish context will be dealt with by then. So that's an ongoing process that we're already drilling into at the moment. I keep going. If you wish to ask another sure, question. Okay. Yes. Take you on to the issue of indebtedness uh, or over indebtedness, which you've mentioned a couple of times. I think that's really interesting because um, the amount of debt that you're in doesn't necessarily correlate with the amount of help that you need proportionately. So if I think of somebody who's in a part time job and a low wage that has one payday loan that's causing them no end of trouble, they might need very serious long term debt advice, which um, is, is much greater than the sum of the debt that they actually owe. Is that built into the formula or is the way that it works based purely on the amount of money people owe? Does that make sense? Uh uh, well, it, again, it's a, it's a good question to say whether the level of indebtedness, I think that relates to the number of people, but officials can tell me if otherwise, rather than the actual quantum of what the, the, the debt is. But the point that you make about how it's very different for different individuals, that should be reflected in what we... It's not necessarily an issue for uh, the UK government or the FC. It's how we configure the debt advice that we are able to provide in Scotland through different agencies. But uh, that, that question of whether it's the number of people. Uh, it just says the level of indebtedness and the uh, documents I've seen would be interesting to get an answer to that. The level of indebtedness comes from a formula that Money Advice Service currently collect data on and it was based on a range of criteria including deprivation indexes, um, level of debt, um, income and a whole range of factors that come together to come up with indebtedness ratio. Um, so it's not just the quantum of debt that an individual has. So would you be confident that um, you know, if the prominence of debt in Scotland is, is low level but very hard for people on low incomes, that that's incorporated into the amount of money we'll receive in Scotland? Yes, we believe okay. it is. Okay, that's helpful. And my final uh, question, convener, would be around uh, the sense that the Cabinet Secretary mentioned the amount of money we'll get from this levy will be double, I think you said, what we've previously received. Can you give debt advice services the assurance that they'll see double the, the money in return? Uh, well, no, I think we have to look, uh, as I say, we have a, um, a proposal to bring forward a consumer protection body, so it will depend on how that progresses. But obviously, having more resource for that, we don't intend to shovel off to some other function. This is the purpose that we want to put it to, but exactly how it will be dispersed, I think, remains to be seen. If I can just make one other point, because you'd asked about our ability to influence this, and um, the response was that um, we will 
continue to have discussions with the Financial Conduct Authority. I think it's just worth pointing out, and for the benefit of the committee as well, convener, that for the first time, uh, and we made representations on this from last year when I came into post, the Financial Conduct Authority will have a full, has now a full-time person in Scotland. It's also true to say that um, the uh, Competition and Markets Authority, um, the CMA, not to be confused with another body, uh, the Country Music Awards, um, is also just about to, again, we made representations on this, about to very substantially increase its presence in Scotland, I think about 35 uh, potential positions here in Scotland. So we are very keen that whether it's the FCA or other regulatory bodies that we have that presence in Scotland. And I think that means it will get a better fit in terms not just of the an improved financial um, situation that we have for debt advice, but in terms of the point you uh, first made about how reflective what we do in Scotland is in the practices that we're able to get the UK government and its agencies to follow as well. So I think it's a promising picture on the, uh, on the regulatory front. And Gillian Martin. Yeah, I mean, largely what I wanted to ask has been covered by Colin Beattie, but just uh, off the back of your statement, you mentioned um, issues around cold calling. And I'm wondering how what, what we can... And obviously, the details are yet to come in all of that, and I, I appreciate that. But given that quite a lot of the regulation around telecoms and cold calling is reserved, just what can we do differently here uh, to well, we, people? So we, in relation to this, can't do... Um, uh, we can't legislate or bring in regulations in relation to that. But what this new body will be able to do, and it's specifically laid out in the regulations that will follow, is to take action on that. So they could ban uh, cold calling or particular types of cold calling. Now, I've written on a number of occasions to the UK government asking them to do that, to take a much tougher line on nuisance calls in particular. So we, through the processes that I mentioned, and not least through this committee, which I mentioned, have a, a direct line to continue to seek the support of the UK government in taking stronger action in terms of cold calling. Cold calling and pensions is one particular bane, but there are others, as you know. So this just gives us an increased, if you like, um, ability to put pressure on the UK government to take action in that area, because you're right, it's a, it's a huge area for people. OK, thank you. Are there any other committee members? Andy Whiteman. Thank you, um, The review of regulation of legal services due to report later this year and I'm just wondering if it reports or comes forward with any ideas about how to regulate claims management companies. Um, in a sense, one will already have ceded authority to the UK Parliament to legislate uh, on that. But are you comfortable that there will be sufficient flexibility to incorporate any of its recommendations in, for example, secondary legislation that might be necessary? It, well, I suppose two things we have discussed with uh, uh, legal colleagues, both within the government and officials, and also we have listened to what the justice committees had to say in these issues as well. So we do uh, want to stay in touch and go with the grain of what's being said. But I think, um, to quote somebody else, um, devolution is a process, not an event. So I think the possibility for future change is always there, and the case has to be made if we want to see that change uh, reflected. But of course. We are open to that if that's uh, what the situation, uh, if that's how the situation develops. So, in a sense, the position that we will be in is you have maximum flexibility. You've got a UK regime in place, but you can amend that if you see fit in the future. Yeah, I, I would concede the point that in relation to this, it's an extremely. Um, if not complex, certainly interrelated set of powers which are going on here. There's some which are quite clearly reserved in relation to pensions and some which are debt advice, which is uh, devolved. Um, so it is quite complex, and I wouldn't pretend that the two governments are completely of the same view as to what will be devolved and what's reserved. So that discussion has been going on up till now, and I'm sure it will continue. And if it seems to be the thing to do, and if, as you say, depending on other... Um, other developments, if it seems to be the case that we think it's best to, to move forward in that way, then we'll do that. We've signalled that already to the UK government. OK, thanks. Um, are there any other questions from committee members? If not, uh, I'll thank the Cabinet Secretary and his um, team for coming in today. Thank you very much.
I'll suspend the session for a few minutes just to allow our next set of panel of witnesses to take their places. Well, good morning to our panel of witnesses. We are now returned to our inquiry on Scotland's economic performance. Uh, I, we have today, uh, from my left to right, first of all, John McLaren uh, from Scottish Trends. Uh, next, Ryan McQuig of the policy and public, or who is the policy and public affairs manager for Oxfam Scotland. So, welcome to both of you. And then we have Michael Jacobs, who is Director of the Institute for Public Policy Research, uh, Commission on Economic Justice, and finally, but not least, Craig DL, who is the Head of Research at Commonweal. So welcome to the two of you as well. Um, if I might start just with asking a couple of general questions. Uh, first of all, I should say that don't feel you have to answer every question. Some may wish to come in on different uh, aspects of different questions, and we don't want this to be too formal in the sense of everyone wanting or thinking they have to come in and put their penny in on every question, every answer. So perhaps first generally of each of you, however, first of all, how do you think the Scottish economy has performed since 2007? Are there particular areas in which it has done well and others where it hasn't done well? Uh, perhaps we could have your sort of general comments on that just to start off. I don't know who wishes to take the question first. John McLaren. I'm happy to go first. I mean, I think it's very difficult to, to say how well the economy has performed in the last decade because there's been it's such a, been such an exceptional decade, in particular, obviously, the financial crisis, which starts at the beginning of the decade and moves us into a completely new era of economics, if you like, with productivity exceptionally low. Um, and then on top of that, you had the, the EU crisis, the Euro crisis, and for Scotland in particular, you've had the impact of, first of all, a very high oil price and then a very low oil price. So that makes it pretty difficult to, to, I mean, obviously in comparison to um, historic, it's done very badly in GDP terms, although the, um, the, the labour market is still is doing quite well, which is again uh, a change from, from what's gone on in the past. Looking at it in comparison to the UK, it's been fairly similar over, over a, the whole, but they've taken different paths to get to where they are. I think the most worrying thing is is what's been happening in the last two to three years, where Scotland has barely grown. It's only grown about one or two quarters of the last 10 or 12. That's partly to do with the North Sea, but it might go wider than that. Um, and I think that's a particular worry in terms of of um, going forward as to where the, where the, the growth is going to come from. In terms of areas that have done well and badly, it's difficult to tell the standard of the, the statistics for Scotland is such that it makes it very difficult to to really look at the sectors and say that's done well, that's done badly. I think there was a, a paper by Spice that said that um, one of the best areas for um, employment growth was communications, uh, uh, information communications and tele um, transport. Um, 
but using a different measure, uh, the employment has fallen in that area. And even in that one measure, it's all come in one year. There's something like a 20% increase. And also in the arts, apparently, there was a 20% increase in employment. Now, these are clearly not realistic figures, but they are the official figures. And equally, in something like um, hotels and restaurants, there apparently has been no increase in, in output in the last 10 years in Scotland, whereas in, in the UK, it's grown quite considerably. Again, I don't believe those figures, but those are the only figures that we've got. So because of the poverty of analysis of the Scottish economy, it's difficult to say who's done well and who's done badly. Why don't you believe those figures? A 20% increase in the arts employment in one year? Why would that happen? 20% increase in telecoms and, and transport? I, I, I've no, I mean, nothing happened for nine years, and then there's a 20% increase. I don't understand why that would be the case. It's also not borne out by, the, by what's happened in output. Output has barely changed in that year. So <clears throat> I think it's a, it's a problem with the statistics. And some, sometimes these are at the UK level. We have to go to the ONS to, to discuss it with them. And sometimes it's like the, the hotels and, and, and um, restaurants figures. It's probably more to do with an understanding within the Scottish statisticians. Right. Um, who would like to comment next? Um, just to, to echo some of uh, John's thoughts there, that it, it can be difficult to, to see what's going on. And I think we'll probably talk about this through the through the session. We might need to th think about just what we mean by what uh, an economy that is doing well, by which I mean, how are we measuring the economy and are our measures appropriate? Um, the financial crash particularly marked a, a, a massive change in, in the global economy and how we look at economies. Um, so the, the, our measures that were developed before then, we, we might need to examine them to see if they're still appropriate. Um, yeah, yeah, as John said, we, we, we might be starting to see some anomalies in the statistics that are coming from, coming from this. Can I, can I pick... Perhaps we could just bring Gordon MacDonald in at this point into the discussion, and then Michael Jacobs. Thanks, Convener, and I apologise for being late earlier. I get held up in traffic. Um, just to set the scene before we get into some nitty-gritty, um, the, the remit of the inquiry is to compare the divergence between Scotland and the UK as a whole with other regions, nations in the UK. So can you just tell us in terms of GDP, I think, John, you spoke about it earlier on, in terms of GDP, how Scotland performs in relation to the other regions of the UK. My understanding is the ONS um, splits the UK into 12 regions and, and has a lot of comparison numbers. How does Scotland perform in relation to the rest of the, by GDP per capita? GDP per capita is, it, it's a, it should be fairly straightforward. That's a difficult question to answer because of what you're looking at, are you looking at just onshore, are you looking at including offshore, are you looking at real terms, you're looking in, in cash terms. Um, now, at the UK level, regional level, then um, there, there's very little data available for that. It's all in cash terms. Um, and it's, it's not really analysed to see, if you look at it and try and work it out, there's quite a lot of things which don't seem, again, don't seem to add up. So the, the robustness of the data, I would put a question mark against even much more so even than, than Scotland's data, which is far superior to, to any other region. Even Wales and Northern Ireland don't really have very good GDP data and certainly not sectorally broken down um, and not in the same that we've got national accounts now that, that look at it in terms of expenditure and income as well. So it's very difficult to, to say. On the labour market side, looking at it from that side, instead Scotland re continues to do relatively well um, not as well as the South East and the South in general, but better than most other areas. Although it's come down a little bit over the last 10 years. 10 years ago, it was doing particularly well above the UK. Now it's slightly below the UK average, but it's still in international terms and even in UK terms doing relatively well. And in terms of um, the Eurostat data released on the 30th of March of 2017, um, taking onshore and offshore, um, it would suggest that there's only two areas of the UK that has better GDP per capita than 
um, Scotland, and that is London in the southeast of England. Does, does that come as a surprise? Not if you include the North Sea, no. Uh, I mean, if you include the North Sea, then there's two ways of looking at it. If you include the North Sea, then Scotland's done very, very badly over the last decade because both the price is now very low and the production has been falling. If you look at it in level terms, it's still relatively good because you're adding that on. But most of the income, most of the GDP related to the North Sea ultimately ends up abroad because it's almost all foreign-owned things. So we don't have a measure of GNI, which would take that into account, gross national income. Um, but if we did, it would be a more accurate reflection of where Scotland is. I think it would still be London, South East, Scotland, maybe third or fourth. So it would still be relatively high. Yeah, Ex excluding North Sea oil, it, it, Scotland would be in fourth position. Mm, um, that sounds about right. Yeah, East of England would be the other area that came in. Yeah, and noticeably that Wales and Northern Ireland, the other two constituent countries, are right. doing very poorly. And in terms of the EU28, how would Scotland perform? be on any table you and you just that numbers i haven't i've had a look at that a while ago i can't remember off the top of my head um i imagine certain within it certain areas will do you know aberdeen will be doing particularly well Ed, edinburgh will be doing well others will be doing pretty badly but i i, I don't have enough knowledge in that area to see relatively again according to the eurostat data that was released in march of last year scotland would be ninth out of the euro 28 countries in terms of GDP per capita. Mm -hmm. Does that come as a surprise? Is that including or excluding North Sea? Um, that's including North Sea, but excluding North Sea, it would um, drop another two positions to 11th. Mm -hmm. But at 9th, it's above Finland, France, Italy, Malta, Spain, etc. Yeah, I mean, the Scottish Government has published data like this uh, uh, for a while, and I think including the North Sea, Scotland was something like fourth. Um, now it's maybe ninth or tenth, and that's the North Sea impact. So you really got to take that out to get a better impression. There's other areas. Um, I mean, the, the classic country that, that is distorted in this way is uh, Luxembourg. Um, and then Ireland has had to recently change its GDP, the way it compiles its GDP, because of the international flows in it. And Scotland is in a, a difficult position to, to get a good idea of what its, its relative standing is because it's not just North Sea, but also there's quite a lot of ownership in areas like whiskey, financial services, energy sector, stuff like that. So uh, this, the quicker we can get a, a, an idea of, of um, these flow inf international flows to get to gross national income, then the better we'll have a, the quicker we'll have a better idea of what Scotland's true um, international standing is. Okay, thanks so much. <clears throat> Perhaps some comment from Michael Jacobs before we come to a question from Kezia Dugdale. Um, so I'm not an expert on the Scottish economy, don't pr pretend to be. Um, so I think one of the things that it's worth saying in this context is that the UK economy as a whole has is and has been and is performing pretty disastrously. So, uh, of which the Scottish economy is, as you pointed out, um, better than average. But the average is very distorted because the UK economy is overwhelmingly dominated by London and the South East. And uh, as the uh, economic geographer Philip McCann has pointed out, uh, there has been a kind of decoupling of the London and the South East economy from the rest of the UK um, uh, for 30 years, but exacerbated over the last 10. And of the rest of the UK, Scotland, as you say, is actually doing better than most of the English regions, Wales and Northern Ireland. But the gap between London and the South East uh, and the rest of the economy is very great. The reason I say we've been doing badly as a whole is because of the performance of GDP per capita, but most of all, earnings. And the extraordinary thing that's happened in the UK economy over the last 10 years is the decoupling of GDP growth and earnings. We used to have a fairly reliable relationship between national income and average earnings. When national income rose, average earnings rose. Um, and there, uh, there have been changes in the degree of inequality, but by and large, that relationship held 
um, pretty much throughout economic history. Over the last 10 years, that's, um, those two things have been decoupled. So we've had GDP growth, even per capita, um, but we haven't had earnings growth. And earnings have been stagnant now since 2007. And this is um, something very fundamental, and I, th I think we all really need to be aware of how fundamental it is. We assume that what we want is a growing economy. Those of us who spend a little bit of time thinking about it assume that the reason we want a growing economy is because that means we have growing incomes, but we don't anymore. And that does call into question uh, the, uh, the, the nature and content of our economic growth and its relationship to earnings. And I think this is a bit of a crisis for policymakers throughout the UK. And it's not confined to the UK. So that's the other thing to say, which is that most developed countries have been going through a similar kind of uh, problem since the financial crisis. And in some cases, particularly the United States, since long before, which is that growth, um, it, the benefits of growth are not flowing to the majority of households. Uh, the US is the most stark example of this, where almost the entire benefits of growth over the last 30 years have flown to the top, have gone to the top 10%, and quite a, uh, and a very high proportion to the top 1%. But it's something which all developed economies have, have experienced, even those which have much lower levels of inequality. So, um, I obviously this committee wants to look at the performance of the Scottish economy, but it is part of a wider UK economy, and it, that is part of a wider kind of global Western capitalist economy, which has not been performing well in very fundamental respects. Um, <clears throat> Gordon McDonald, a brief follow-up, and then Kizzy. Just, just on that point you raised, <coughs> Michael, how, how would you rectify that situation? So, do you want to take the rest of the session uh, to answer that question? I mean, I, I have a whole series of things which I think I don't know whether that should be the subject of kind of further questioning. But after you've done some ground laying, but okay. that is exactly what I've come to talk about. So, but I, I think probably we should have some more general comments first, and then let's go through some of the some of the things. Yeah, perhaps your two best points at this stage. <laughs> um, no, I don't think I'm getting in, in tired at the moment. Right, Kezia Dugdale. Yeah, I've got a question that I'd like to hear from all of our guests on, but before I do that, if I can just pick up a point uh, from John's uh, opening remarks. He discussed a, a poverty of analysis around Scotland's economy. W what do you mean by that? What's missing and what would you do about it? Um, <clears throat> when the, the Scottish statistics are released uh, for GDP uh, or for the labour market, there's no analysis of why something has changed. Occasionally, if something like Longanic closes down, there'll be a footnote saying that the, this figure is low because of that. But by and large, there's no real analysis of um, these. this thing has changed and we're a bit concerned, we don't really know why this. If you ring them up, as I do, uh, they quite often do have quite a lot of information about why a particular sector has done particularly badly. But for some reason, and I know there's a debate within the department, that is not put out into the public to, to a large degree. Um, so that, that's the first element of it. Then the second element is that there is very little research done in Scottish universities on the Scottish economy because it is seen as a regional economy and, and the way that academia works, it's, it doesn't have the same um, kudos as looking at com comparing um, across different countries. So there's very little, um, when I was in the Scottish civil service a, a few years ago, I tried to do a piece of work. I tried to organise a piece of work to look at the main sectors of Scotland by um, experts in Scottish academia um, in about 10 different sectors. I think I got one application on whisky. Um, now, it may be slightly different. This was 20 years ago. Maybe slightly different now, but it's not that different. So unlike a place like, say, Ireland, which um, is, OK, it's smaller, but has a more detailed understanding of its own um, of its own economy, then that makes it more difficult to, to know how, what to do about it and what the underlying problems are. And then that's also um, made more difficult by the fact that there aren't many economic think tanks in Scotland who, um, with with the exception now of, of Fraser Valder, who have beefed up their, their, their analysis. Um, but you know, if you compare that to, to London or even to Ireland or most other countries, there isn't much real uh, analysis of the Scottish economy done by sort of halfway houses between politics and, and academia. Um, 
That's helpful, thank you. Uh, and a more generic question for the panel. I mean, there's obviously um, a debate around the degree to which public policy influences Scotland's economy and Scotland's economic growth. So I'd be really interested to hear from our guests um, one policy from either the Scottish or the UK government that's had a direct impact on Scotland's economic performance. And you can determine whether that's been a positive or a negative one and share it with us. I'll start. Um, this is not. This is. There was a piece, interesting piece of research done by somebody I used to work with, Richard Harris, who used to be in CPPR, looking at productivity in Scotland. Now, traditionally, it's um, two areas where where government is is uh, tries to spur things on: is more inward investment and more entrepreneurship to get more um, companies started. His research found that in Scotland, inward investing companies and just new startups. Um, had uh, contributed negatively towards productivity. Now, that's contrary to most international um, findings and contrary to the finding that you got for the UK as a whole. Now, as with all research, it, probably more research to be, needs to be done to understand it better, but there's clearly a fundamental issue there. Now, in the inward investment, it could be related to the fact that of the um, Silicon Glen impact that, that, that ultimately was, was negative. But it's not very. It's pretty spiriting if the evidence is that if we have more startups and more international investment, it'll it'll worsen our productivity. That can't be good in the long run. So, an area like that, which is um, what you would want the, the policy to be, does does seems to be having a negative impact in Scotland. And so we need to understand that better. Um, yeah. I'm not sure it's such a, a policy area, but I think when we talked about what we measure is what a country values. So I think the sort of national performance framework was a sort of stepping stone or going a step in the right direction to that path about what really matters to Scotland. Um, for Oxfam, back in 2012, we did a, a sort of consultation with 3,000 people in Scotland and said, what matters to you to lead a good life? And people didn't say the number one priority was economic growth. Um, they didn't say that they wanted fast cars. They didn't say they wanted big TVs. They s said like more sort of social foundation levels. They talked about affordable and safe housing, physical, good physical and mental health, living in a neighbourhood which is safe to go outside. And then it was having work, but having satisfied work, whether that was paid or unpaid, and then having good family relations. So I think national performance framework sort of gone the right step, um, but I think it still has economic growth or it has growth at the heart of it. I think if Scotland really values what the people of Scotland want, it needs to invest more on that sort of measurement level and actually do policies that rectify that. As we said about GDP. Um, Sorry, Ryan, we yeah. are going to come on to All some right. questions around inclusive growth, but if I could just push you a little bit further mm -hmm. on, you know, a, an interventionist policy that's come from either the Scottish or the UK government has had either a positive or a negative effect. I'm, I'm sure Oxfam would have a view on that. Yeah, I think the sort of the fair work aspect of it and fair work convention where it has gone out and gone to people and said what, what matters for work and how they can try and do businesses. I know the business pledge, um, we're, we're not overly critical of it, but we're saying that it's, again, a good step, but I think that's, it's not sort of, I don't think it's compelling businesses enough, and I think more could be done on that aspect. So I think talking about fair work and decent work as a pair compared to the UK, where it's just jobs, 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 is going to get people out of poverty, uh, as we've seen of in-work poverty levels, that's not the case. So I think those sort of two measures about national performance framework and about sort of fair work and going out to businesses and the business pledge sort of is a step in the right direction, but a lot more needs to be done. Um, well, it hasn't had an effect yet because it's only just been announced, but we were very, common we were very excited to see the, the announcement of the, the Scottish National Investment Bank and to see that starting to, to, to get some planning and funding behind it. This does have a potential to have a major positive effect on the Scottish economy, uh, reforming the way we fund housing, fund energy and, uh, and other projects. But, I mean, we're looking at the last 10 years yeah. rather than the future. I, I support the Scottish Investment Bank too, but we're trying to do an analysis of the last 10, so if there's mm. something else that you had. Um, 
Well, I'll let others speak to, okay. speak to that. Michael? Um, well, there's been something called austerity for the last um, eight years, and that has affected the whole of the UK economy, including the Scottish economy, more than any other simple thing. Um, it, the economy, jobs, earnings depend on demand, and we've had a massive withdrawal of demand over the last eight years. Um, uh, and that demand has not just been uh, lost in the in the uh, public sector. What happened after the financial crisis was that private sector, the private sector retrenched. It had huge debts of its own. The, the crisis was a crisis of private sector debt, not public sector debt, of course. So the private sector saved and has been saving ever since. And UK companies are net savers in the economy. We, what companies are meant to be for is taking other people's savings and borrowing and investing and then growing. Uh, British companies, including Scottish ones, have been net savers in the economy, which means that they've been withdrawing demand. Um, at the same time, until very recently, overseas demand was very weak. Um, and if overseas demand is weak, private sector investment is, uh, is weak and you've got net saving. Um, and the public sector also withdraws its demand by cutting public spending. Mathematically, because all saving and borrowing in an economy has to balance, all savers are matched by borrowers, you're left with private sector, with household debt. So if you look at the sources of growth over the last seven years, it's been uh, household debt. Household debt has now risen again as people um, uh, borrow to uh, getting close to the levels it was in, in 2007-8. The, Bank of England has already um, uh, warned about unsustainable levels of debt. And in, this wasn't a context in which the UK government um, uh, could afford to withdraw demand because the rest of the economy, the private sector, the overseas sector was not um, spending in the British economy. That uh, we've been left with, with household debt. And so we've had not enough demand in the economy. This was a time when the UK government could have borrowed very, very cheaply with absolutely record low interest rates. Um, and so that's ultimately the main reason why the UK's re recovery from the recession of 2009, uh, 8, 9 has been the slowest of all European countries, in fact, of, of almost all developed countries, and why we've only recently, in the last two years, got back to per capita household income, um, uh, which is which as it was before 2008. So that really is the overwhelming policy context for Scotland as for the rest of the UK. Thank you. Um, may I just follow up on that? How, how would that contrast with other European Union country economies, for example, Germany, where they have surpluses um, and yet introduced what they would have called austerity measures or some would have called austerity measures uh, where these same issues that we have in the UK that you've touched on, such as rising household debt, um, don't exist. And yet the same measures were introduced, which you seem to be suggesting have caused certain things in the UK, but the same measures in other countries didn't result, to put it in broad terms, in this. So I, I'm not sure I follow how you say that the one follows from the other when so, it didn't so the, in other the, countries. So this, Germany is a very instructive example. The structure of the German economy is different from the UK structure. So German firms have been investing and the overseas balance for Germany is much more favourable, um, which allows them to have had a, a much lower level of austerity. So the degree of withdrawal of demand by the public sector in Germany was much less. Um, uh, but that's allowed them, the, their, the conditions in the rest of the economy has allowed them to have a mild uh, package of austerity measures over the last seven years with much less impact on the German economy, which is much uh, uh, stronger. So it is, um, I, I'm not saying that, uh, uh, that in every economy at all times, um, uh, austerity reduction of public spending is a bad, but in the British economy at a time when British companies were not investing when our overseas balance was so poor and when we could not afford household debt to be rising, it was the wrong policy. And that's the, the context. And so you absolutely have to look at different economies and different economies have behaved differently at different times. If you look at the US economy, you've had a stimulus package which, which, was, kept, which was maintained for much longer. Um, so the uh, American economy didn't go through the, the, the uh, austerity, the depth of austerity that we did and it came out of its, its recession in, uh, much earlier than we did. And you really do need to look at the speed with which economies have came out of that recession, the depth that they got into, but then the speed they came out of it, and their overall balance of, their, of, their, of each of the four sectors of the economy to see the way in which Britain has been an outlier. And that is where our very low uh, growth rates come from, in my view. Thank 
I'm just wondering about, uh, in terms of forward planning, is it also reflective of how countries plan going forward, whether there is proper long-term planning? For example, the, the German approach thing would be to have very long-term planning in their approach to such matters. I would, I would a a absolutely say so, but it's many, it's many things. Germany has a much more resilient business sector with banks that are much more involved with their companies. They take a longer-term view of investment, so bank, German banks tend to be much more tolerant than British banks. They tend to be much more invested than British banks are in, in German companies. German companies don't lay off workers um, as easily. They tend to retain workers. They have trade unions who organise collective bargaining, which actually moderates wage growth. The interesting thing about Germany is it's strong, strong trade trade unions, but not very strong wage growth. The trade unions help moderate wage growth in return for relatively um, stable employment in, in companies. So there's a, the German economy is really structured very differently. I hope we'll get on to the issue of employment, because I think that's a really an employment regulation and bargaining power, because I think that's very important. It's a particularly important part of the German story. Right, thank you. And now to Dean Lockhart. Uh, thank you very much. I'd like to continue the discussion on policy, but br bring it back to, to Scotland. Um, this, as you will know, the Scottish Government's economic strategy is centred around the four I's, uh, investment, internationalisation, innovation and inclusive growth. I'd like to get views from uh, each of our members on how the economy has performed against or in those four areas over the past 10 years. And perhaps I could start with uh, Professor McLaren, because um, your index, the index you publish of uh, social and economic well-being, covers a number of these areas. And I think that shows over the last decade that Scotland has uh, slipped from 16th place in OECD to 20th. Uh, perhaps you could uh, give us some views and some idea uh, of the trends behind that move downwards in the index of um, social and economic well-being. Yeah, the um, Scotland's. Some of Scotland's slip is due to the fact that the index looks at GDP and includes the North Sea for Scotland uh, and looks at it in, in cash terms. So that takes in the fall in the North Sea. So in a, in a sense, it's the reverse to the point I was making earlier on to Gordon MacDonald, um, that that isn't a real loss to Scotland because it was it's largely going overseas. So it, it, it it kind of exaggerates the, the, the drop in Scotland's position a little bit. But on the other hand, the, the, the previous position, the earlier position of being high, was also kind of like flattering Scotland because the GDP level was, was artificially high because most of it is, is ending up overseas. However, the other um, aspect was the decline in education standards as measured by PISA, which is, I think Scotland is <coughs> one of the worst performers I think the only the only one the only country that performed worse than Scotland over that period was Finland, but Finland was first when it started, so it's now not first, but it's still pretty high. Whereas Scotland was kind of like mediocre and it's 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 falling down. Um, other countries that did particularly well were tend to be more in the Eastern Europe, Estonia, and places like that. However, where it, Scotland is still relatively uh, as its lowest position is in um, uh, its t healthiness health health factors, i.e. its life expectancy, which um, has always been low and hasn't caught up. You would expect over time, if you're particularly low, that you would take uh, examples from other places and you should be able to catch up over time, but that hasn't been the case with Scotland. There's been a slowing down of life expectancy increase in a number of countries, um, but it's particularly worrying when it's, you, you, your life expectancy is always fairly low. Now, there's a... a uh, and the, the, f the fourth factor is... is um, participation, which I've used the employment rate for, which is not perfect, but it, it gives you some indication, which whereby Scotland has done uh, reasonably well, but within that you would have to look at what sort of jobs are being created. So it's just kind of a, like, it's a way of widening it out from just GDP, because GDP is the most difficult one to measure, because as I've said before, for Ireland, Luxembourg, various other countries, and for Scotland, it, there, there can be hiccups within the, the data, which means it's, you, you, have to, you have to adjust for it. Um, but it gives you a wider perspective, and I think the, the, the two worries for Scotland are the decline in, in education, which obviously affects your future, uh, the skill levels of your future workforce, and the continued low levels of, of health, which can affect participation um, as well as um, productivity. Yeah. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, just to talk about the inclusive growth element of it. Um, I think 
we've seen, we, we did a recent report calling for the Poverty and Inequality Commission. And in that report, uh, just to say why it's needed, we said at the minute levels of inequality in Scotland are record high, last seen since the early 90s. And if you look at uh, the wealthiest 10% of Scots own over 9.4 times the amount of wealth, combined wealth, as the bottom 40% in Scotland. So I think inclusive growth has not, you know, transpired in Scotland. And the whole, and that goes back to what we value and do we measure GDP and is it trickle down economics when we know it isn't, it's more of a sticky treacle that sticks to the top. So I think that I, the inclusive growth, we need to do a lot more. Okay. Would the other members want yeah, to join? I'd like to pick up on that point on just even the, the appropriateness of the inclusive growth because we as others have said, we're, we're not seeing a growing economy at the moment. And where growth is occurring, it is decoupling from the, um, the, the lives of most folk in, in, in the country. Um, I think when we talk about inclusive growth, it's probably quite natural for, for politicians to kind of focus on the growth part. It's, it's a bit easier to measure and it, it gives a good headline. Um, but we can easily get ourselves into the position where we get growth in the economy and it all goes to the top couple of percent and that's not very inclusive if the economy then shrinks if there's another recession that could tend to hit the bottom 20 percent more than it hits the top so it's even less inclusive and you could get these cycles of economy that rapidly ratchet up inequality and i think we've been seeing that over the past decade so i think with that particular measure maybe we need to to start thinking more about the inclusiveness than the growth can I just follow up on one of the other eyes, innovation, which is read together with productivity. Productivity, I think, across uh, the UK and across the world is a, is a focus point. But for the past seven quarters, uh, productivity in Scotland has, has declined over the last seven quarters. I just wondered if any of the members had a view on why productivity in Scotland is falling. Can I, can I come in on that one? Um, so productivity is stalled in the whole of the UK, um, including in Scotland. It's interesting that you raise innovation and productivity together. Um, there's a bit of a myth about the relationship between innovation and productivity, which is unfortunately has been rather perpetuated by the government's industrial strategy, um, uh, both its green paper and its white paper, which focus quite correctly on the productivity problem and then focus almost the policy attention on our frontier innovation firms which don't have a productivity problem. If you look at the firms that are at the leading edge of innovation in aerospace, in, in fintech, in pharma, uh, in motor manufacturing, they have very high productivity and it's been growing about 6% per year. The productivity problem lies in the rest of the economy, what we've in the IPPR <laughs> Commission on Economic Justice have called the everyday economy, where the vast majority of people work in retail, in, whole, in wholesale, in hospitality, uh, in food and drink and light manufacturing. And that's where our productivity problem lies. And the problem for them isn't that they need to be at the frontier of technological innovation. Those companies don't, that's not what they do. They need to adopt innovation. So they need to be at, on, at the end of the innovation that is the diffusion of innovations throughout the economy. But that's a very, very different from what the high-tech sectors do. Most of the high-tech sectors are not about innova in, in diffusing innovation in the rest of the economy. So I think innovation is really important because innovation keeps you at the frontier of, uh, uh, of, of technology, which is obviously very important. It also keeps you at the frontier of exports, which is critical. It's the innovating firms that tend to be the exporters. But if we want to deal with productivity, and we do want to deal with productivity because productivity is one of the sources of low and stagnant wages, then we need to look at the rest of the economy, which is actually where the majority of people work and certainly the pe where people with stagnant earnings work. Um, and that's where we, um, uh, it, it, we have to look at the labour market. So this then bears on, on, I think, a key question in Scotland, but also in the rest of the UK, which is the structure of our labour market. Because our labour market has become so flexible, in which it's literally now possible to employ people by the hour or by the piece rate, which is how a lot of gig economy, uh, is, the gig economy is organised, companies have very little investment, uh, incentive now to invest in the technologies, in the equipment, in the machinery, in the capital, or indeed in the training and, of their own workforce, which is actually where productivity comes from. Investment, 
in, in both in physical and in human capital is where productivity improvements come from. But if you don't, if you can increase output by a little bit simply by employing a worker for an extra hour with no responsibilities to them, so no other cost, that's what you'll do. And that's what we've seen. So we've seen a huge growth of a very, very flexible, uh, casualised labour force. And that has helped repress productivity because productivity is about investment. Um, and it does seem to me that we've now reached the point where the great advantages that we wanted of a flexible labour market, which was more jobs, is now working against the kind of economy we need. Those of us who were around with mass unemployment should never want to go back to mass unemployment. Getting more people into work, record high employment levels is a good, no question about that. But we have got record high employment and record high insecurity of employment. And that insecurity of employment helps low productivity, as I said, but it also makes people not spend because they're insecure, they don't know where the next pay packet's coming from, they have no savings, and so on. So we do need to look at the structure of the labour market, I think, to get to the productivity problem. Can I just add a couple of points to that? <clears throat> First of all, the, the, the Scottish pattern of productivity has been very different from the UK pattern in recent years. Um, so Scotland's productivity improved substantially up till about the last seven quarters when it de declined um, quite sharply, but it had been doing particularly well catching up with the UK average. Neither of those trends is particularly well understood. It's probably got, um, I, I wouldn't put an awful lot of faith into the productivity figures. And again, there's been very little interpretation of it, um, but it, it's 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 not necessarily a good thing that when productivity is rising because it could be um, for factors that are not not really uh, improving productivity innovative this in the long run but again it's something that needs to be um, to be looked at in more detail um, the, the figures that are out there but in terms of the what Michael was talking about there I think the Nick Crafts did some work back in 2013 for the David Hume Institute and. Um, one of his worries was the lack of diffusion and the low share of innovation active businesses in Scotland, even relative to the UK, where it's not seen as particularly good in the first place. So I think that is a, an area, again, it's a difficult one to do, and I think, again, Richard Harris might have looked at this in some of his work. But given that there's precious little work in this area for Scotland, you know, we might as well use what has been done. <laughs> Uh, thanks very much. If I may <clears throat> just pop, finish up with a question on, on the labour market, because I think, uh, Michael J Jacobs, you mentioned a, a number of interesting points. In previous uh, economies, we saw a jobless recovery because of automation, whereas we're almost seeing the opposite here. We're seeing high levels uh, of uh, employment, but that's not feeding through to economic growth because a lot of the new jobs being created are, are low value and they don't, they don't have the same multiplier impact on the economy. Now, we all want to see higher value jobs being created. Is there, and we operate in a global economy now, is there a country out there that has a policy framework where this actually um, is creating uh, higher productivity, higher value jobs? Um, well, <clears throat> so within Europe, um, Japan, uh, within Europe, Japan, within Europe, Germany, I'll come on to Japan later if we need to, Japan's a very interesting case. Um, Germany has a um, as I said, a, a very different kind of labour market. Sweden um, also rather similar. So that the structure of the labour market in uh, it has two features, which I think we've both of which we've moved away from in the UK, in in these two countries and some of the other Scandinavian countries. The first is quite a lot of labour market regulation. So there are which is um, uh, which is largely about requiring employers to have minimum standards for um, uh, wages. Uh, but particularly for how you pay things like overtime, um, benefits, and so on, combined with relatively high levels of trade union, um, uh, trade unionism, trade union density, not throughout the German economy, but in, in parts of it, certainly higher in Sweden, which gives workers a kind of bargaining power within the labour market. So one of the fragment, one of the things that's happened in a more fragmented labour market is individual workers uh, find it very difficult to bargain their wages up because they are not doing it collectively, they're doing it, they're not even doing it now as part of um, a common workforce. They're not part of the common workforce, they're self-employed. And so, and that bargaining power is 
uh, inevitably a way of the lack of bargaining power is a way of keeping wages wages down coupled with a lack of regulation in the uk system which means that you can pay more or less any you can have more or less any structure of wage rates of over time and of hours and so on um, and so both of those two economies which have maintained relatively high employment we have higher employment so you know part of the flexibility has been higher rates of employment um, has been those two different features and I think we need a rebalancing on our labour market. I think we need to move back to some more regulation. So there are, there are basic things that you have to do as an employer with stronger trade union densities to help bargain wages upwards. Um, and you know the, the, the historical shift, which is true in the UK, is true elsewhere, which is that the labour share of national income has been in decline, very significant decline. So that is of total national income, more has been going into profits and the owners of capital have received more of it and less has been going into wages and salaries. That is partly because workers can't bargain their, their share of it upwards. And so I do think this is a, uh, an important part of what we need to think about now. Just to come back on that uh, point, um, I wouldn't necessarily say low value, I'd probably say low pay jobs. Um, we did, a, again, Oxfam did a sort of consultation with uh, 1,500 people that were in low paid work, and we called it decent work. And also decent work is also one of the SDGs, goal um, eight. So it is incumbent on all countries to provide and help uh, to create decent jobs. So I think that is sort of key. It is, again, going back to the in-work poverty, you know, 64% of children live in a household where someone works, and then that's up to 70% for working age adults. Um, so it, again, it is what can Scotland do to help those people on low paid and there is like Sweden takes another sort of avenue where it, you know if you have social value it pays a better wage especially for people like in childcare workers um, and I think that's something that you know the Scottish government and um, workers uh, companies can do as well there is um, organizations like B corporations and stuff like that and there is more um, co-ops so I think We've done a lot of work with um, low-paid um, workers who have said it is that sort of gig economy where they turn up for work, they don't know, they might be sent away again, said, all right, you're not needed today. So they're in employment and out of employment, back in and out, and they keep going back, and there's no safety net. So I think that is something that is incumbent on the Scottish Government and um, employers and society as a whole, especially when we signed up to SDGs who are meant to provide decent work for all. And I think it's something that we need to sort of look at in more detail. Yeah. Yeah, I think that was quite interesting when you raised the, uh, the idea of low multiplier jobs, um, because our economy is going into a bit of a shift. We've got some demographic changes happening, which means one of the growth areas in job-wise is in personal care. Now, personal care is one of these sectors that maybe measures like productivity may not be appropriate. Increasing productivity, done if it's done badly in personal care, could mean seeing more clients in a single shift, which means cutting visit times from half an hour to 15 minutes to 10 minutes. Increases your productivity, but may not give you a better service. So that's maybe another example of where, just be careful what you're measuring where. Thank you. Um, I'll come on now to a question from Julian Martin, and I think Tom Arthur uh, as well had perhaps a... Yeah. follow up to what was being discussed but Gillian Martin first. Thank you I'd like to look at the future and there's one thing I'd like to put out and ask for your opinion on. So we've had a lot of discussions around inclusive growth but we've also had a lot of uh, discussions already about what poverty can do to the success of a country and what impact that can have. I would like to know your views on the idea of a universal basic income and how that might have an impact on stimulating an economy, improving the the well-being, welfare, happiness, I suppose, of a country, and some of the things that Michael Jacobs has been talking about, the, the, the kind of uh, a different measure of, of a country's success economically. I might have to sort of plead the fifth on this. Um, Oxfam, obviously, where sort of all of our um, analysis is about um, evidence-based, so. We're still at an early stage for this, and we haven't taken uh, an over overt view on this. But um, I think something that we have called for is the Poverty and Inequality Commission, and I think they're tasked with sort of looking at how that will 
maybe operated in Scotland. So we're all for sort of pilot areas and seeing what evidence comes from that. And if the evidence leads that this is a good way of reducing uh, poverty and inequality, then we would be supporting that. But I think it's a sort of holding answer at the minute to see where it, what type of pilot operation is going to happen in Scotland and then the evidence from that and then we'll take our view on that. I think I'm going to have to sort of say plead the fifth a bit. Okay. Well, the, the universal basic income is, is a policy that Commonweal actively adv advocates. We recently published a paper looking at reforming social security, and, and that played a key part in it. Um, so, so from the evidence that we have seen, we do see a lot of potential uh, for it to, to greatly um, reduce poverty and reduce people falling through the, the cracks in means-tested systems, uh, avoid, you know, uh, avoid losing out on claims that are due because they don't know how to apply or avoid being sanctioned for for, for things that they are claiming through various reasons. Um, universal basic income is a broad uh, area. There are very many different models of how, how much you give uh, as a basic income. So it's difficult to say in general what the actual impact would be um, and certainly you, you also want to couple it with, with other policies um, like maybe better social housing so that the, the, uh, the basic income doesn't get eaten up by private rent or, or, or other factors. So we're very much in favour of it. We're very excited to see the pilot schemes go ahead and, and get the data from them. Um, and yeah, we're, we're, we're interested to keep following it. Do you have a view on how it might stimulate an economy there's been quite a lot of mm. you know obviously finland has been trialing it and what they've found from some of the people who've been involved in that is that they've actually earned money on top of it it's, it's, it's allowed them to not be kept from the labor market yeah. because they're worried about losing any kind of benefits it's actually yeah there's a couple of strands to how it can improve the economy uh, on, on, on one you know the the marginal propensity to spend is um, that people who don't have a lot of money, if you give them a little extra, they tend to spend it rather than saving it. Um, so that tends to stimulate uh, demand in the economy. The other strand is people who have enough money to meet their basic needs. They live happier, healthier lives. They're not such a, 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 a cost on the healthcare system, uh, for instance. Um, they, can, they can be more productive in their work. Um, and, and that can, uh, can, can, can boost the supply side of the economy as well. Um, I think it's really interesting that there are some now experiments in basic income because we've been talking for 25, 30 years about it in theory and it's much better to have some evidence. So it'll be very interesting to see what the pilots um, uh, prove. Um, so the first thing to say is it, it really does depend how much money people are getting. If you want to take people out of poverty uh, on an income basis, they need more money. So a, a universal basic income, which provided an, an inadequate sum of money, doesn't do the fundamental thing that you want to do with regard to poverty. And obviously, the more money that is provided in it, the more, the bigger the, the whole system has to be, because every, there's going to be much more money going through the public sector and then back out again to individuals and has to be taxed and spent. So one of the, it seems to me that the, in a way the balance of the argument here is what's the impact on work incentives and the marginal rate of taxation for people who would otherwise be on benefits? So the real problem we have in any welfare system is that, is that the marginal tax uh, rate for people on benefit is ridiculously high. I mean, of a rate that none of us would accept with our taxes. People have withdrawal rates from benefits of 70, 80, 90 percent. And that's what a basic income in principle does away with, because everybody will get the money and you can earn. Um, so that's its huge advantage. And I do, th uh, my, my, uh, without having yet got the evidence, my assumption is that that much improves the situation for people who would otherwise be on a means-tested benefit or would a benefit. They are more likely to work and to find security of income and so on. The, the other side of the equation is, in order to do that, you are giving everybody an income, which means that you have an enormous flow of cash through the government coffers which has to be taxed at a much higher rate than we are, we are most of us uh, used to. So of which an, a, a, a vast majority is not changing the income circumstances for the people who are being taxed and given the income. So there's an enormous administrative burden, which is itself costly, because obviously all of that system has costs, in order to improve life 
as I think it's very likely to do for the people at the bottom and who would otherwise be on means tested benefits. That's, a, I think, quite a difficult policy choice to make, um, which is why the, the experiments, the pilots that are now going on, I think will furnish much more evidence about that, um, uh, including its public acceptability, because as I say there are a lot of people who will be deeply affected in income terms, in their tax and their basic income, but for whom it's not really aimed. Uh, ultimately, their situation is not designed to change and won't change uh, very much. So I think it'll be very interesting to see the evidence, but those seem to me to be the arguments on either side. I don't, I don't know an awful lot in this area, but um, a couple of things that, that sort of come to mind is I know that um, Harry Burns, who's on the Council of Economic Advisors and he used to be a Chief Medical Officer, I think, is is pushing this um, on, I guess, health and e equality grounds more than economic grounds. But he's his exa the examples that he's given that he say, he thinks are <clears throat> very convincing come from the USA, I think from the 70s, maybe the 80s. I think Reagan stopped them, so I think it was the 70s. <clears throat> now, that's a long time ago and far, far away in terms of geography. But it would be interesting to compare um, the results from that to what's happening in Finland, because they're very different societies, um, di very different levels of inequality. So you wouldn't have thought that the same policy would have the same impact in those two different countries, but it'll be interesting to see how much the <clears throat> commonality there is. Um, and if they, are, if they are different then, and you're moving to more to a Finland or, or sort of Scandinavian type style, then you, you probably would need to move away to a, from a more liberal market economy to a more coordinated economy and higher taxes. Uh, otherwise, you'd be competing perhaps with education spend and health spend. So it, it does become, it's certainly an area that's, that's worth exploring, but I think it's quite tentative at this area, and, and the Scottish government's doing the right thing by look, you know, do, doing pilot studies because um, it may be that there's quite a lot of social norms within a country that affect how, how well it works. A couple of other policy areas for, for, based on improving th productivity, I suppose, in the, in the future. One of them is about getting 100% broadband across Scotland, which will uh, hopefully have um, encouraged parity of, of access to digital platforms in rural areas, for example. Another one is the, the, the increase in childcare hours, which will allow families to access the labour market. Uh, in, in a way that's not going to completely sting them in their wage packets. It used to happen to me when I had two children, paying for two children in childcare, um, basically running to stand still. How do you see them uh, um, impacting potentially on the future in terms of the, the, the productivity of, of Scotland's population? Um, well, in, in the 21st century, I think access to the internet at a reasonable uh, rate is, is uh, verging on being a basic human right, um, so it, it's pretty essential that we get this get this rolled out as quickly as we can. Um, and, and yes, uh, there's I, I've heard from a lot of uh, a lot of people in rural areas for, from a rural area like myself, um, who where, where businesses have, have said that they, 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 they could invest and expand more if they could get more better access to better internet. Similarly, on the, on, on the childcare, um, although to tie back into your universal basic income from some of the pilot studies that were seen in that, one of the, one of the, the, the areas where you saw people dropping out of the labour market because of universal basic income were parents who wanted to spend more time with their children, um, which is maybe not a bad thing in itself. Um, so you've got maybe two policies there that... <coughs> I'm not going to say they're going to compete with each other, but they might provide for people who have different desires out of their life. Maybe both positive, depending who you are. Any other thoughts on that? No, well, one final question. It's qu a yeah. Quick point on the... <clears throat> I don't know much about broadband, but in, in terms of the childcare, I think that's an important area, but I would, I would say it's more important to look at it in terms of early years investment in childcare. Childcare is kind of like passive because it's parent-centric about allowing the parent, whereas early years investment I would see is more active of developing the child and giving benefits to the parents as well. And that means further down the line, reducing inequality and improving skills. So I think it's um, making sure that it's high quality childcare verging into early years investment that's, that's most important in that area. Mm. Can I, uh, I, I, you absolutely agree on about early years, but childcare is vital for, for gender parity in the labour market. Most um, young children are looked after otherwise by 
by women, and it's um, uh, it, it is very very difficult to get gender parity in the labour market unless you have high quality childcare. And if you look at the correlation between those two things, it's in, in, across countries, it's very it's very clear. Scandinavian countries, very strong childcare policies, the closest um, gender. Um, pay gaps, lowest gender pay gaps, uh, and and, uh, and and particularly importantly, because the, we're now discovering that we have a proper equal pay problem with people not being paid for exactly the same work, but the basis of much of the gender pay gap is career progression, and it's in the childhood, early childhood years when women fall behind because they... Um, Many of them uh, can't get adequate childcare, and so they drop out of the labour market and then come back in at a lower level. So for, for gender parity, which is then part of productivity, since we should be using all of our workforces uh, needs, childcare is critical. You've anticipated my next question, which is about wh where do you see the gaps in, in the Scottish economy? I mean, our, our people are our, our greatest resource. You know, forget everything else as our people. Where do you see in the future our opportunity to um, provide parity um, for the people that are maybe not getting access to the labour market, that are not as productive, and, 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 and what do you think is going to be the key to that? Is it as simple as childcare? Is there more that can well, be done? Well, I, I, um, the issue of vocational training and skills training is going to become increasingly uh, important, and there have been important developments in, developments in Scotland in this. But some of the work that IPPR has done on future skills, we're we're moving into a into a time of of changing of changing structure of jobs, and um, the real risk as jobs become automated is that middle jobs get squeezed. People at the higher levels will be will find themselves as complements to the to the machines that work around them, and because they have more bargaining power, they are more scarce. They will be able to keep their wages and salaries up. People will be displaced, particularly in the middle, and the risk for, as we've seen over the last 20 years, is if you've got a middle-ranking job, is that which then gets it doesn't appear, it doesn't exist anymore. You move down into lower skill jobs, and we've now got lots and lots of people who are working at beneath their skill and education levels. Uh, the cross-country comparison suggests that we have more of those people in the UK than any other country in Europe, um, and so keep keeping the skills, keeping people, particularly in middle. Um, uh, in middle skill levels, trained to do the new work that's coming is going to be really important. So, uh, the skill system has not been, uh, hasn't really worked anywhere, um, but we're going to need more and more of an emphasis to make sure that people can access the skills that keep their wages up uh, within the new, within the kind of new economy that's emerging. To move on then to, I think Tom Arthur had a, a follow up on something there. Yes. And then perhaps move on to another area that can be headlined inclusive growth, although we've um, Got dipped into that, as it were, anyway, and so John Mason will follow from after Tom Arthur. Uh, thank you, Convener. This really, um, as I suppose it was a supplementary to the last point that uh, Mr Jacobs made. Um, he spoke earlier of productivity having stalled in the UK, and this, but the problem really lying in the everyday economy as such, um, and that the structure of that characterised by low wages and low regulation um, and ultimately the gig economy disincentivises in in investment in human capital and innovation. Now, your last point, now you spoke about the historical trend of the hollowing out of middle-income and mid-skilled um, mid jobs. To what degree are these low-skilled jobs exposed to future developments in automation, robotics, artificial intelligence? I'm thinking of the... Uh, um, self-employed delivery driver or the Uber driver, for example. What level of exposure exists and are we, are forecasts of a cliff edge and catastrophic levels of unemployment, are they unnecessarily apocalyptic? Will we muddle on or will humans go the way of the horses? That's one, that's one expression was given. Um, so it, j let me just take that first, and then I'm sure colleagues will want to, 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 to come in. So uh, the IPPR have just published, in fact, a report on automation. Um, uh, and we, um, we've done some analysis of the, um, uh, the differential impact on different sectors and then different parts of the UK um, according to how, uh, how those sectors are mapped geographically. Um, and uh, there is a, uh, a differential impact. Basically, areas where there are more low-skilled jobs are more vulnerable. So Scotland has an interestingly mixed economy because Scotland has a lot of high-skilled jobs as well, which are by and large less vulnerable. Nobody is invulnerable. Um, 
and uh, and so uh, uh, and, and so there is there it, it really needs to be looked at by sector. We do need to be very careful, however, and we've tried to be um, uh, 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 cautious in the way we describe this, because um, the 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 pattern of automation, and of course automation we've had for two hundred years. Automation is not a new thing. The pattern of automation isn't by and large, that whole jobs get eliminated. Jobs get changed. Um, a very famous survey, famous to people who follow this subject, um, of American jobs, is only one job that has been eliminated in the US as a result of automation, which is lift, um, people who step, lift bellboys or people who are standing, are standing lifts and so on. Although, in fact, some of those have come back, in fact, so um, in uh, particularly, uh, particular places. So mostly jobs change, and jobs change mostly alongside alongside new technologies. As we're all aware, we all use technologies, including things that were previous. We, we do things like we, we do our own typing. Formerly, a lot of people would not have done. That has effectively been a kind of automation, but there have been lots more jobs. And we, we are not looking at mass unemployment because the impact of automation on the particular sector has to be placed alongside it's the impact of the higher productivity and higher demand on the rest of the economy. So what we've seen in different sectors, let me give you the, the simplest to illustrate. Agriculture has seen enormous automation over the last 100 years, and almost nobody works in agriculture now compared to how many people worked in agriculture 100 years ago. That's mass unemployment in the agricultural sector. But no country with formerly a very large agricultural sector, including Scotland, has seen mass unemployment in general because the demand went elsewhere. And if you look at other sectors that have had major technological change, like healthcare, yes, some people have been displaced, but the demand for healthcare has been massively increased, which means that overall many more people are employed. And meantime, where, where, where else have jobs been created? They've been created in the automation sectors, in the IT and computing and so on. So for every job that has been, been lost as a result of us now doing our own typing, many, many more have been created in the new jobs, the new sectors, in ICT and, uh, and so on. So the overall impact is quite likely to be neutral or positive, depending on how the monies are circulated. So from our point of view, I, it isn't mass unemployment that we should be worrying about. We should be worrying about the distributional implications because that's really where the effects will occur. And this is the risk that lower skilled workers will be more easily displaced for two reasons. One is that they, their jobs are cheaper. So it's easier to, uh, to it's more cost effective to, to, uh, um, uh, to automate in those, um, and because they have less bargaining power to keep their wages up. So it's the distributional effects that we need most to worry about with regard to automation, which means we need to manage that process. And I think skill levels is going to be critical to that, as what I said in my, uh, my previous answer. So um, we absolutely need to be on top of this. The other thing to say is that this will happen relatively slowly. Um, technically speaking, lots of jobs are automatable tomorrow. It'll happen slowly because every job that's automated is a decision on the cost of capital versus the cost of labour, on policy and, and, and profitability and so on. So the fact that something is technically autom automatable does not mean that we're about to see it automated. Yeah, um, it's interesting you brought up the horses. Um, yeah, the invention of the automobile was fairly terrible for the horse industry, for the horse wrangler industry. Great for car mechanics. So yeah, we could see the nature of working work change, but and if, as Michael says, it's 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 how we respond to the distribution of productivity there. I think it was Bill Gates has been famously suggesting the idea of a a, a, a tax on the robots. Uh, maybe a bit more, bit less tongue in cheek. You know, maybe we need to refigure our taxis on output and productivity, regardless of how it, it comes about, whether it's human labour or robot labour, and then feeding that into a redistribution mechanism like a universal basic income. Maybe that then increases the bargaining power of low-paid workers, uh, or just simply frees up people to do jobs that are, uh, I don't want to say low value, but low feedback, like more of these care jobs, more of these personal jobs, more art and culture jobs. Um, so we could end up with a very different society, but I don't, you know, I, I'm, I'm not entirely sure it's going to going to be this mass unemployment singularity moment. No, it, it strikes me because people talk about you know, a fourth industrial revolution. It does seem to be something qualitatively different about this, and, and perhaps previous, be that in the 18th or late 19th century, fundamentally about machines with a capacity to think. Potentially by the end of this century, machines that are conscious that can learn 
quicker than a human being can, can process information. And if you apply that to big data and big data analytics, it's transformative in a way, perhaps. It's, it's difficult to imagine. Now, I appreciate there's other people actually say the, the inventions which have been most transformative are things as simple as a washing machine and a dishwasher. And I'm just, I'm still trying to weigh up because I, I I mean, expose this, as I say, to kind of our kind of reassuring accounts, such as given this morning, but equally credible sources suggesting actually it could be far worse than we'd imagine. But I just wonder if the panel would agree, whatever, however this you know progresses over the course of this century, it will require a fundamental restructuring of the economy and our idea of what an economy and a and social security and a welfare state is. Is that fair to say? Yeah, I'd agree, with, I'd agree with that completely, yeah. Yeah, I think you can use it as an opportunity. Like, it frees up uh, people not having to do um, the type of work that doesn't get well paid or uh, means that they have to do multiple jobs. It frees them up to do more, probably, social good aspect of it to, to the betterment of the country. And, that, and that's incumbent on the government to um, anticipate how they're going to... Um, you know, either tax that or what, how they're going to recalibrate the economy to make sure that it does free up people and doesn't put people on like the scrap heap, but makes sure that it frees them up for the betterment of the country for what we're measuring differently. And that, I think that is an opportunity instead of uh, a risk. And if, just at least making a final question, it's what should government be doing now? There's an argument, perhaps, some of the mass unemployment we saw in the 1980s was avoidable if uh, reforms had been staggered, maybe from the 70s on, we we'll stay in the UK, rather than having this big bang moment. Uh, what action should government be taking now? Can I, can I come in? Let's just... Uh, um, if you, you talked about over this century, so that's another 82 years. Uh, I'm not making predictions over 82 years. So um, I'm sure over this century we shall have to reconfigure our economy and our welfare state completely. But in the kind of in the field of policy making, where we're thinking about, um, if we're lucky, the long term is 10 to 15 years, and as you, most of, you know, for many of for many of us, the long term is much shorter than that. Then um, I don't think we're going to see a complete transformation um, in that way. So and you need to uh, we need to really try and understand what these technologies do. Um, machine learning, which is, as you say, a, in many ways a qualitatively new form of automation where, um, where uh, computers, by and large, but um, uh, learn from the data that they're handling, will make a big difference in data analytic jobs. So we know that radiographers are under threat. A, a machine can now read uh, an X-ray or an MRI scan much, much more accurately than a, ra than a human radiographer can. And that is changing the nature of radiography because now the machine input comes and the radiographer is turned into more of an analyst of, of what, then what to do. Um, but these are still computers. They're, they are not robots. So robots have only just learned to catch a ball. The physical dexterity of robots is still really, really small. So they can spray paint cars, but there are most human actions robots can't do. So, um, and mach so machine learning makes data analysis really. So lawyers and financial and financial auditors are under threat from those things because a lot of that is data analysis, and big data analysis is much better done. So there are definitely jobs which are under threat. But look at how many more human needs we we have that could that need to be met and for which we don't have any conception yet of how a machine could do what a human being could do anything to do with planning with decision making with emotional intelligence with caring with creativity we simply don't have machines that can do anything like that um, and so this is this is going, not going to be a very rapid thing i who knows what will happen in mid-century or later but we shouldn't be thinking that the next 10 years we're suddenly seeing machines that are going to take over uh, all the jobs um, and of course they're also very expensive so this is an economic decision about who invests in these things these things don't just happen companies need to invest in these machines and so on and at the moment there are um, there is very relatively little application so in answer to your question about what government should do the first thing is we probably need more robots not fewer Britain is not suffering from a, a surfeit of robots uh, which are putting people out of work. We have 
if, if, if anything, underinvestment in, in the most advanced technologies. I'd like to see an industrial strategy, which the government, to, be, to its credit, the UK government, is beginning to, to, to put together, which tried to get the diffusion of new technologies out much more widely. I'm much more concerned about the diffusion of technologies which are actually technically 10 years old than I'm about something brand new, which is not going to diffuse very quickly, because we need higher productivity in the everyday economy. I'd like to see a much greater focus on skills training and making sure we've got workers who are skilled um, skilled right correctly and I'd also like to see a much better debate about the ethics of all of this I do think some ethical issues arise we've called for a, 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 an authority for the for the um, ethical use of robotics and, and artificial intelligence in the same way that we created an authority for human fertilization embryology um, 10 years ago so I think there's a number of things that government should be doing um, before it starts panicking Suggesting that uh, lawyers uh, are not creative and have no emotions. Uh, <laughs> uh, would you be a lawyer, Chair? <laughs> we'll leave that as a rhetorical question, if uh, I, I might, and turn to John Mason now to move on to slightly different subjects. Th thanks, Convener. I mean, one of our, our main themes, I think the reason we have you folk here as a panel, is, is to look at the area of inclusive growth, and that, that term has been used uh, already, and I'd like to, well, first of all, find out what it means. Um, the Scottish Government defines inclusive growth as, quote, growth that combines increased prosperity with greater equality, creates opportunities for all, and distributes the benefits of increased prosperity fairly. So I suppose my first question is, is, is that a fair definition? Could you improve on it? What's good in that? What's bad in that? Sorry, could you repeat it again? <laughs> Seriously, yes? Yes. Um, right. Uh, growth that combines increased prosperity with greater equality, creates opportunities for all, and distributes the benefits of increased prosperity fairly. So there's kind of four, four bits to it. It's four bits to it, but the, the, the second, third, and fourth seem remarkably similar. Um, you, could take, you could interpret them different ways, but <clears throat> I think that's part of the problem with, in this area. The very fact that I had to, and I genuinely did want you to repeat it because I couldn't remember, um, but you could you, you could change that. You could put in more about intergenerational. You could put in more about gender equality, about geographical equality, about racial equality. Put in more about the environment. Put in more about stocks rather than flows. Which is why I don't think really inclusive growth. Eventually, inclusive growth just just falls back to growth. So it falls back to GDP. That's in most countries what still what still happens. There can be a bit more of a push for greater equality and looking at different measures. <clears throat> but most countries are still fairly, especially politically, fairly obsessed with, with GDP. And I think it's... So you don't like inclusive growth? Have you got another term we could use that's better? I, I would just say that, that inclusive growth is fine, but I would define it a different way, and that's the way that you want to define it, that the, as a Scottish parliament, as a Scottish government, as a Swedish government or whatever. So is it more about the environment? Is it more about equality? gender equality, racial equality in general. Um, as long as you keep it fairly vague, like it is at the minute, then it allows people to sort of like, um, or, or it means people don't really know what you're focusing on and to avoid putting in policies that definitively say, okay, there will be less um, um, pay inequality between in gender pay inequality because that is a, a clear area where we were going to have more inclusive or the fact that the uh, unemployment rate in the Western Isles should be no different than it is in Edinburgh. That is one of our key um, things for equality. I mean, an example, um, I don't know if it's still there, but for example, the, the, I think the French train system was built on something like you had to be, you had to, there had to be a train that could get you from wherever you live to a major city in or, or Paris or something within an hour. It, it's not that, but it's, it was something like it. So that is equal. You know, that is a policy that is that has led to um, greater equality in terms of transport co uh, connections. But I don't think. It, I think there's a, there's a, a willingness and a desire for all these things to happen, but there isn't really a focus on any particular aspect of them, which means that we still fall back onto. GDP and just, you know, up to 2007, there was this big push towards green growth and, you know, Cameron going to the Arctic and stuff like that. As soon as the, the, the financial crisis happened, in a lot of countries, that just fell away. And it's just, just give me growth. I mean, I don't care 
just give me growth. And I kind of we're still kind of. I want to bring the others in as well. I think we're a wee bit pushed for time. Um, (laughs) I mean, do the others agree with that, or? To a certain degree, I think my my colleague Catherine, uh, Dr. Catherine Trebek, says, uh, "Where we're going to stop? It's like uh, inclusive growth, equitable growth. uh, So not being no fat growth, or I can't believe it's not growth growth. Um, For us, for Oxfam, we." Again, when we talked about the humankind index, we want we would probably call it uh, building a more human economy. Um, and we have talked about before about the donut, about how we've got planetary boundaries, um, creates an outer layer, and then the inner layer is about the social foundations. And in the safe space in between is where our economy should be. Um, and it highlights all the different um, mechanisms to look at that. Um, so, yeah, so I think we would call it like a human economy to make sure that it is like, prosperity and success. How is it measured by people that live here? Um, that's probably more of a succinct answer. I mean, the, the, we've got an Oxfam view. Is it, is it possible for everybody to agree on this, or is it just such a vague term that we're, we're all going to have different views? To, to boil it down to its absolute minimalist definition, what you're talking about is how does the change in economy change inequality? Change in the size of the equ- economy change inequality. But as John says, what does inequality mean? What does growth mean? Are you chasing only growth, or are you accepting that, you know, it could be possible that a um, a, a, a technical recession was due to a massive amount of wealth redistrib- redistribution? So you've you've increased you've, you've decreased inequality at the cost of the size of your economy, or or maybe you've you've brought in a bunch of imports which have boosted your size of your economy, but you've hollowed out your manufacturing base because of the substitution effects. So, yeah, to give a very broad um, uh, term here, is, is that it, when you get into the detail of it, it can be very, very difficult to measure because you, you, you do need to start defining... I mean, you're depressing me here. This is quite pessimistic. <laughs> let, let, me, let me... I don't know whether I'm going to depress you less. I, I think it's a useful term, and I think... Um, Inevitably, we need a term that people can then grasp, and it takes a while till a term becomes commonly used. This is now the term that the OECD is using, which means that it has a, an international currency. So um, I personally rather like it, but I think it's really important that, it, that, it's, that we understand why it's different from, from what we might have had in the past. And it seems to me that the critical difference that is meant by the term inclusive growth is that the distributional outcomes are embedded in the productive production system and are not the a consequence of post hoc redistribution. And that seems to me to be the really important distinction. So if you like, there are three ways of considering the distributional outcomes uh, from an economy. There is trickle down, which assumes that it, the more growth you get, and in fact the more growth that, that accrues to the people at the top, the more that you will get some trickle down and people at the bottom will get it. So that's one conceptual framework. Another one is redistribution which is that we will allow the economy to grow and we will recognise that it will be unequal, but we will then redistribute through the tax and welfare system in order to make sure people at the bottom get some of the, 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 the fruits. Inclusive growth is a third model, which says that we want the productive system to distribute fairly and more equally, more equally, to the people in the middle and the bottom half of the income distribution in the economy, not as a post hoc redistribution or as a hope for trickle-down, which, in, as we know, hasn't happened. And so how would you do that? So that seems to me to be why it's useful to have a distinctive term, because I think this is a different thing from both the trickle-down and the redistributive models. Um, Jacob Hacker, the American political economist, called this pre-distribution. I'm, I don't know whether that... It's the same basic idea, which is that you need to have that distribution embedded in, in earnings. And, and so, so can so I press you on that? I mean, does that mean that the, the, the wages, therefore, have to be closer together? Because then, if wages are closer together, you don't need to... Yes. So you need to have um, a, a, a much lower differential between high, higher wages, higher salaries, in, um, uh, executive earnings, middle salaries and the bottom. And you need to do that through a, a combination of um, partly taxation policies, but also labour market uh, policies the, and the bargaining power, as I've said before, of, uh, of people at low, uh, of lower incomes and of the ways in which wages are structured. So it, is a, it seems to me that is a different model. Then I'll add one other thing, which is that's the flow of income. Then there's a stock of wealth, which is the ownership in the economy needs to be more fairly distributed. What we have as a result of this declining labour share and increasing capital share is a widening wealth inequality. And wealth inequality is much worse than income inequality. It's ten times 
the level of income inequality is wealth inequality. And most assets are now owned by a relatively small proportion of the population. We need to distribute the assets better. So there's a wealth component to an inclusive growth model as well, which is, I think, partly about uh, ownership of, of housing and land and partly about ownership of shares and companies. And we would like to see a much wider distribution of the share of share ownership and of land and housing ownership in order to get the stocks of the economy more fairly shared as well as the flows of income. Okay, well, thanks very much. I'd love to ask thank more. You, but thank you. I think, I think we're running out of time here, so I'd like to come on to a question from Colin Beatty and then to a question from Jamie Halcourt johnson Thank you, Peter. Um, we've had evidence previously that the Scottish labour market has changed substantially over the last uh, 10 years. Broadly, have these changes been positive? Probably not. Ah. <laughs> I mean, there's been, as with the UK, there's been an increase in self-employment and an increase in part-time employment. Um, interestingly, going back to a point that Tom Arthur made before, um, there was a paper out this last week by the Resolution Foundation talking about this hollowing out of jobs, and it's saying it's not really been hauling out of, of mid-level jobs, it's been a, a reduction in male hours drop, uh, in, in male hours moving from full-time to reduced hours or part-time. And that's usually involuntary, involuntary. Um, so that's probably not a good thing. Having said that, given the condition of the world economy, then it's, it's worse than it was, but it's, it's, it's better than you would have expected in 2009 when such a severe recession was going on. So the degree to which um, the, the labour market has been um, elastic and has, has moved around has, has improved the number of jobs versus what would have happened in the past. But whether that's um, where you want to stay you may, um, with, a num with the sort of less um, job security and, and uh, perhaps lower income, uh, then it's difficult, yeah, it's difficult to see. Just to come on something you, you said there, you talked about the reduction in male hours. Has that been balanced at all by an increase in female working hours? My recollection, I haven't looked at this for a while, but my recollection is, yes, it has. I think the overall number of hours worked in Scotland has increased. Um, so, and, and, and if you look at the, <clears throat> if you look at GDP per capita, it's not done that well. If you look at um, household income, it's done better because the um, more people are working, so the employment rate's gone up. So more, uh, more elderly people are working, and more women are working, sort of thing. So there's been a there's been a shift in in the pattern that has led to the, you know to, to, the, to the average household income. Um, but the degree to which that's been voluntary or involuntary, some of it's voluntary, some of it's involuntary, um, and then where you want to go with that is is and where where the economy will allow you to go with that is, is difficult to guess. I don't think it's been positive in the aspect of the old adage that you can work your way out of poverty when we've seen the uh, high levels of in-work poverty. And again, the, the increase in inequality between shareholder value to what workers are paid before in the 70s, before it exploded, there was like quite a level trade between uh, workers' pay and the, those at the top. And then late 70s, it just like, sort of exploded and still continues to do that. So I think, again, that goes down to the social value that we place on the jobs that are low paid at the minute. And there's issues about participating budgeting, I think, can help with that. And the, with when we talked about the sort of the human economy and pre-distribution, I think that was what the Christie Commission was talking about as well, like 40% of local government spend went to rectify the problems of economic growth. So I think there's a lot more that we can do. So, um, But I think we sort of recognise that, like as I said before about uh, national performance framework and that we're all signed up to the uh, SDGs, which does have inclusive growth in that and it does have about creating decent jobs. So I think we as a society and a, a sort of global community are, do recognise that we have to go on a different path because what's happened before has not benefited the whole of community. Um, so, yeah, so I don't think it, overall it's been a positive, but I think we're, we're seeing changes where we can make a positive change. Come on to Jamie Halcourt-Johnson now um, for a slightly different area, if I may. <laughs> 
Uh, thank you very much, convener. Um, we've touched very briefly on some of the um, differences between the different parts of Scotland and how they, uh, they perform, their economies perform. I was just wondering if, uh, if you could kind of tell us what regions of Scotland have been performing better or less well and how we, looking to the future, uh, try and, uh, I suppose, tackle those regional differences in terms of uh, business activity, um, labour market, participation and growth. I think it's... Um I mean, Aberdeen, the Aberdeen area has traditionally performed well. It's obviously going through a, a downturn now, but it's it's that and central Edinburgh have been always been the areas that are wealthiest um, uh, and doing reasonably well in terms of of, of other um, other factors. It's more difficult that the if you look at the employment figures or the GDP figures, there's been quite a variation. Um, across different parts of, of Scotland. Again, I, um, I can't, I haven't got it completely to, uh, to hand, but um, I think the, some of the rural, more rural areas have, have um, suffered a bit in terms of uh, the employment, change in, in employment in, over the last 10 years. But you'd have to drill down a bit to see, because some of these areas are reasonably low um, populations, to, to understand better why that's happened, whether it's a generic thing or whether it's a local thing in terms of a, an industry that's, that's, um, that's declined. But I, I, don't th I think in general, there hasn't been an obvious shift in the, um, the geographic uh, um, position uh, in Scotland. There's not been anywhere that's done particularly badly or, particularly, uh, partic or stands out as being particularly well. Yeah, like John, I've only got sort of partial data on this and a few anecdotes, for example, you know, areas in the Highlands where there's been a community buyout and that has led to a, a boost to the, the economy in that particular area. Um, but it's difficult to sort of generalise that further. Um, I think we do hit a, a point where, you know, the, the, the economic data for regions of the UK can be spotty in places. The economic, uh, the economic data for regions within those regions, i.e. Scotland, can be can be even harder to drill into. It can be difficult to measure. Okay. Can I, can I ask then, I mean, do you think the overall Scottish economy could benefit from more of a focus on perhaps uh, regional growth? I suppose for Oxfam, I don't think it's necessarily regional. It's about that community growth um, and letting people decide for themselves what's best for them um, and like I say it'd be anecdotal evidence about um, things like um, there's Beath um, Community Development Trust um, their council took the decision to close their football pitches they did an analysis with the help of Oxfam that said that they were spending £40,000 on pitches outside their local area and decided this is crazy can we come together and work with the council to get the pitches again and they sort of took it over and that had knock on benefits for the community but also they then they decided to have um, washing machines to do kits and stuff like that instead of them going to individual houses and stuff and that creates another economy about combating climate change as well so I think <coughs> communities if you give them the chance they they have the answer so maybe not as a, as a whole regional but I think there's a lot more we can do regionally um, in regions with communities themselves and I think we just need to ask them. I think, like I say, one of the bittersweet moments for our humankind index when we asked people, one person came up to us and said, thank you for asking our views. And, you know, we had people saying, oh, how do you reach um, these hard to reach people? And for Oxfam, there's no one that's hard to reach. It's just easy um, to ignore. Um, so I think that's what a lot of the more of the government and politicians, there seems to be that sort of disconnect between people. Um, and maybe that's, and politicians, maybe that's why you've seen the rise of um, Trump and in France, so there was a close run thing, and German politics as well. So I think, again, there's, there, there's a need to be, again, more human economy, more connected with people to say, you know, what makes for a better economy for yourselves. I think the, the, the difficulty with saying, would you prefer more regional growth? <clears throat> Well, two things. One is um, versus what versus greater emphasis on agglomeration, where there are some economists would say there's more prospect, prospect of a faster um, growing economy with, with larger agglomeration. So they've got that. But that's probably more of a societal preference. But the, the big one is how would you do it? I mean, you know, 
there just aren't that many ways uh, you could improve transport and stuff like that. But you can do those things that government does. But in terms of building up businesses, um, you know, the, the track record in clusters and, and, and industrial policy, uh, regional industrial policy, isn't good. Um, it's haphazard, and it's, it's there are successes, but it's difficult to say that is what you do and you get success. I think the successes are fairly um, random. Thank you. And Andy Whiteman. Uh, thanks very much, Convener. Um, I just want to go back to a point Michael Jacobs made very at the very beginning, where you talked about GDP growth having been decoupled from earnings growth. Um, so my first question is, what's happened to that economic dividend? Where's it gone if it's not gone to earnings? And the second is that some of that GDP growth has been due almost substantial, almost entirely to the growth in personal debt, um, household consumption rather built on per personal debt. Much of that personal debt over the last decade has been due to rising housing costs. Should government, as a matter of policy, um, be seeking to reduce the housing costs for the population? Do you want me to have a go to start? So. Um, where's it gone? So the, the, de the decoupling is between GDP and average earnings. Um, and so some of that has gone into higher earnings. Um, uh, uh, and we know that there's been quite an increase in, in, in higher earnings. Some of it's gone into profits, so it's not gone to labour at all. It's part of the shift away from, uh, from labour towards uh, capital. Um, um, uh, and, uh, and part of it's gone overseas. Um, so it's not gone to British, there's, we've had GDP growth, but it's gone to, to owners of GDP uh, who are not British. Um, so there's a whole variety of different, uh, of different uh, uh, destinations, as it were, for, for, the, for the portion of growth that's not gone into average earnings. Um, in terms of, um, uh, of, uh, of housing costs, I think this is a, this is a huge issue now. Um, the average housing costs have now um, gone into a multiple of income, of average income, which um, makes housing unaffordable for many people, particularly in urban areas and particularly in, in, uh, in, in the London and the South East, where it's, it's, it's become kind of crazily acute. I mean, to a point where um, people in their 30s who only 10 years ago would have expected to be able to earn enough to, to afford a deposit and a, and a mortgage can't do so and really have no prospect of doing so and are now waiting to earn, own a home when their parents die, which of course may be in their 50s or 60s. And that is now, with, in London and the South East, that's become a kind of new norm for people who, whose incomes and whose class positions meant that they would have expected to have been in a completely different situation only 10 years ago. A lot of people obviously never expected, if they're on very low incomes, to have, to have um, owned a home. So I do think that this, is, uh, this has become critical. It's a very difficult issue to deal with. It is too glib to say we need to build more homes, because ho however many homes we build, and of course we should be building more homes, um, the I impact of that on average house prices is r still relatively small. House prices are determined by supply and demand for the whole housing stock, not just for the new housing stock. Um, but we do need to deal with it, and, and, and it seems to me to be an area of policy that much more thinking needs to go into. We will be trying to do some ourselves, um, but uh, uh, I, I, the, the problem now of the disparity between income and housing costs is, is, is absolutely acute. It's not universal. I mean, it's different in different places, obviously, as you know, but... Um, it's not just the uh, upfront cost of, of housing uh, and the, the, the rents that's, that's becoming a problem. It's the, it's the running costs of the house, heating and electricity costs um, are, are getting particularly um, acute. Fuel poverty is getting particularly acute. So um, when, when we're talking about building more houses, then we, we do need to make sure that they, they, they meet the absolute highest possible energy standards just to, to make them not just affordable to buy, but affordable to live in. I think um, Commonwealth is going to be doing doing more work in, in coming months on that, so hopefully we can come back and talk about that at a later date. Suppose if you want the political cover for it, um, like I say, I'm going to go back and keep banging on about the Humankind Index, but the top two in joint equal place was people wanted an affordable, decent and safe home and then a physical, a good physical and mental health. So that sort of shows you that NHS was always up at the top, but now for the people that we've spoke to, um, housing is, is equally as important now. So I think that shows you the value that people put on decent quality housing. And they look to their government as well to help. 
think the housing stock, though, is it won't, it won't so solve things <laughs> quickly, but I mean, it, a consistently higher rate of house building um, will eventually get you to a good position. You might have to do temporary things in between. But you have to be careful in terms of, so if you're looking at, say, reducing the public rental costs, then that could have knock-on, that, that could look like a good thing to do, but it can have knock-on effects in terms of there being less available, put, put more in the private market because um, they're making less of it, and also being of a lower standard because they're, if they're making less money off it, then they're, they're not updating them um, and, and um, re uh, repairing them as, as consistently as they, they used to. So it's, you, know, you want the market to work as much as it, as it can, but it's not working particularly well at the minute, so then it's how to get over that. I think one of the things that's, that's been disturbing that isn't really addressed very much is, is the second and third ownership by people would normally have one house and that would be it. But increasingly, as wealth diverges, people use that extra wealth to buy a second house. Um, originally for their children being at university or something like that, but, but increasingly, and that doesn't seem, that that's kind of makes the market, um, it brings more people into the market and squeezes more people out. So possibly higher taxation on second and third houses and things like that. Um, again, you'd have to be careful in how you did it, not to make too many disadvantage um, the side effects, but, but possibly that's an area it could be looked at. Getting back to your earlier point about the definition of inclusive growth, um, given that I think the Resolution Foundation produced a report a couple of months ago showing that for every successive generation since the 30s, the proportion of their income they're spending on housing has been rising and is now very, very significant for the so-called uh, millennials. Um, is that something we should hardwire in, as Michael Jacobs was suggesting, to our policy on economic, on, 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 on um, inclusive growth, um, a metric around housing costs and a target for housing costs? Yeah, I mean, I think there are certain basic things. Um, education is free, NH, uh, health service is free, um, food prices are their, their market, but their, their uh, electricity prices are, are um, managed to some extent. Um, and, health, and clearly housing is another basic need, uh, but it's much more free to the market as to what to do in it. So it would seem to be an area that, that government should get more involved in. Clearly, it's much bigger problem in London and the South East than it is, say, in the North East of England, Scotland, somewhere in between. Um, but because it's such a basic need, you would th there does seem to be more of a role than it's currently the um, seen uh, actively taken up by the by various governments. Right. Thank well, you. Um, that brings us to the close of this evidence session. Thank you very much to our witnesses for coming in. I'll now suspend the meeting and we'll move into private session. <laughs>